Hey everybody, it's Mr. Smeeds. Welcome to Ape's video notes for topics 8.12 and 8.13, which will cover LD50 and dose response curves. Our objectives for today are to be able to define LD50 or lethal dose 50, and to be able to evaluate a dose response curve. The skills that we'll practice at the end of today's video will involve calculating a mathematical solution and also using data to explain an environmental concept. So we'll start off today by covering some basic definitions of LD50 and dose response studies. So a dose response study is a study that exposes a model organism, usually something like a mouse or a small rodent or some sort of amphibian or reptile, uh, sometimes even plants, but it's going to expose this organism to a chemical in order to measure the response. Now the independent variable here is the concentration of that chemical. Um, so that's where the term dose comes from in dose response studies you give organisms different doses or different concentrations of a chemical, and then you look at the response. So the response is the dependent variable. Usually we're looking at death or impairment, uh, and so that's where the term LD50 comes into play. LD50 represents the lethal dosage 50, meaning the dosage that will kill or be lethal to 50% of the organism. So an example here is we could look at mice and use arsenic. Um, so the LD50 level for mice and the contaminant or the um, toxicant in this case, arsenic would be 13 milligrams per kilogram of body mass. So what that means is if we expose mice to either food or water, that results in them having 13 milligrams of arsenic per kilogram of body weight. Uh, now mice aren't gonna be a kilogram, but we can use decimal places to still represent this idea. Um, that's going to kill 50% of them. One thing I wanna point out is that LD50 data will usually be expressed as some sort of mass per some sort of other mass of body. So again, you know, you could have grams or milligrams per you know, unit of, of body, which would be kilograms usually. And you can do parts per million. So this would be if we're looking at air or the water, we may measure you know, the parts per million of mercury in a body of water. Uh, and then finally, we can also have mass per volume of either food or of blood. So you might look at the blood lead levels of humans in, you know, micrograms per deciliter. So again, mass uh, per volume. It's really helpful when we know what the units that we are measuring LD50 actually mean. So now we'll talk a little bit more specifically at dose response curves. These are the data from a dose response study plotted out where we typically have percent mortality or whatever the effect the uh, response being studied on the y-axis, and then the dose concentration on the x-axis. Remember, that's pretty typical. We're usually plotting the independent variable, what the scientist is manipulating on the x-axis, and the outcome, or the dependent variable, on the y-axis. So if we take a look here, we have an example of this where dosage of this toxicant, again, in milligrams per kilogram of body mass, is plotted on the x-axis, and then we have the percent mortality or the response of the organism on the y-axis. And so if we look here, we have something called the threshold, which is the lowest detectable level where the response is seen in the organism. So in this case, that would be at about 40 milligrams per kilogram, and that would be the level at which some of the organisms in this dose response study started to die. And again, that's because percent mortality is graphed on the y-axis, so we know that the response being examined is death. This could be something different than death, and we'll talk about when we do sublethal studies uh, in the upcoming parts of this video. The other thing to know is that they usually are going to follow somewhat of an S-shaped curve. So typically there will be fairly low mortality at really low concentrations, then it will start to ramp up after you surpass uh, that threshold concentration, and then we have really rapid you know, mortality rise in the middle of the dose response curve before it kind of levels off as we get closer to 100%. This is just due to the fact that different organisms have different tolerance levels. So a great chance to think back to unit two, all the way back to range of tolerance. And so individuals have range of tolerance. And so not every individual will die as a result of the same you know, dosage. And that's why we do these studies with large sample sizes. We can see here that LD50 in this case is about 100 milligrams per kilogram of body mass. So that means that that is the concentration or the dosage at which 50% of the organisms in this study died. Now we'll take a look at the term ED50 and other dose response uh, studies. So ED50, similar to LD50, refers to the concentration at which 
50% uh, of the organisms in a study have some sort of response, but in this case, it's gonna be a non-lethal effect. So it will not kill the organism, but it is something that's measurable, something that can be quantified, where we can clearly look at the organisms and decide if they have you know, suffered this outcome. Some great examples would be infertility, paralysis, or developing cancer, or a tumorous growth. And so again, when 50% of the organisms have developed this effect, we would call that dosage or that concentration of the toxicant that caused that level of 50% of the sublethal effect, we'd call that the ED50. Um, so we can take a look here at an example. We could think of atrazine, which is a broad spectrum herbicide. We know that it oftentimes runs off agricultural fields and into bodies of water. So that's gonna cause 50% infertility in frog populations. That's a great example of ED50 because we're not measuring death, but we are measuring infertility, something that's still objective and clear. So take a look at a graph here. What we're gonna see is the same general shape as an LD50 curve. Um, so what we notice though is the LD50 curve in blue is basically just shifted further out to the right, meaning that if we continue giving a higher and higher dosage, eventually we'll actually start to see death in some of the organisms. So notice how the ED50 curve is gonna have a similar shape. Uh, we could even be giving you know, similar concentrations, but as those concentrations go higher and higher, we're leaving the category of sublethal effects like infertility or paralysis or cancer, and we're getting into direct toxicity. And so you can see here that it's the same essential type of study. We're just measuring a different dependent variable or outcome, and in this case, it's sublethal rather than lethal. And finally, we'll wrap up today by talking about how the data from dose response studies is used to help set acceptable levels of pollutants for humans to be exposed to. So it's totally unethical for us to do a dose response study on humans. We're not gonna give humans something that we know is toxic and measure the effects in their bodies. And so we use model organisms. Oftentimes these would be rodents, uh, mice and rats are the most common organisms that are used to simulate you know, the mammalian effects or what we'd expect to happen in humans. Um, so what we're going to do here is determine basically the LD50 or the ED50 level for mice and for rats. And then we're going to divide by a thousand to basically take extreme caution into account. So the fact that mice and rats are quite smaller than humans, we're going to divide by 10 to reflect that. And um, we're going to divide by 10 again for safety. And then, you know, if twice is good, three times is even better. So this is not a hard and fast rule of of epidemiology, but it's a general concept that can help you understand. We're typically going to, you know, take one thousandth of the dosage that would cause the effect in in rats or mice, and we're going to apply that to humans. So, a big kind of generalization here. Another thing I want to talk about is acute versus chronic studies. So the problem with dose response studies, one of their limits is that they are usually considered acute. So they're only going to follow the organism for a small period of time and look for a small, you know. Um, host of effects basically. And so we're not going to necessarily look at the trophic, you know, cascade that could happen. We're not going to look at the whole ecological consequence of an organism dying or its population declining by 50%. The other thing is that we're not going to see what long-term developmental issues may happen in the organism, even if they don't die or even if they don't have whatever the ED50 study is, is examining. Um, and so that's where we can do what are called chronic studies, uh, which are far longer term. So we may follow an organism all the way from, from hatching into sexual maturity in adulthood and see essentially, you know, what is the impact on their full scale development. So for practice FRQs 8.12 and 8.13 today, I want you to take a look at these data, which are the results of an LD50 and an ED50 study done for the contaminant of polonium uh, done on rats. And so the first thing I want you to do is explain how could these data be used to determine a maximal allowable level for humans? Uh, and as a hint, if you're struggling, check out the last slide to see what we would divide by to determine that level for humans. And then uh, for part B, I want you to identify the lowest dose that triggered a response in the RTI on uh, number 336 rats and the dose that resulted in 50% of the RTI 336 rats dying. 